All right, welcome everybody uh, to this INSEAD in, in the case session, um, which we are calling uh, Digital Music Disrupted, the case of BeatDAP. My name is Noah Askin. I am an assistant professor of organizational behavior at INSEAD. Uh, and judging from the attendees list, I have some former students in the crowd and some friends, which is wonderful. Nice to see you, welcome all. Um, just a little bit of, of housekeeping. Um, this is something, this is a case that's been actually now a year in the making, um, and we're excited to sort of informally launch it today to all of you. Uh, and, and the nice thing about this in the case, um, these sessions are really to try to replicate and recreate the in-class experience of the case discussion. Um, and normally we would be posing questions to you and the audience and asking you to put yourselves in the shoes of the founders or people in the industry or investors. Uh, and one of the beautiful things about today and these in the case uh, sessions is that we actually just go straight to the horse's mouth and we get to talk to the founders and the prominent people involved. In this case, we have Morgan Hayduke and Andrew Beatty who are the co-founders and we'll come to them in just a minute. I also wanna to introduce today Laura Healy, who is an INSEAD alum, 17J. She is the primary case writer. Hi, Laura, welcome. Uh, the primary case writer, and she is also a startup founder and investor extraordinaire, uh, and now a budding expert on the music industry amongst other industries as well. Um, so let me share my screen with you all real quickly uh, so you can see what we're up to for just a little bit here. Um, good. So uh, first, a thank you to the sponsors of this today. Um, that's Accenture Strategy. That is the blockchain initiative at INSEAD. A special thank, thank you to Pascal Balze, who is the Associate Director for Global Projects uh, in the Deputy Dean's Office, who really made this webinar happy, happen and made the case writing possible. Uh, a special thank you also to Ali Mad Madavji, whose name I probably just butchered. I'm sorry, Ali, if you're here. He's an INSEAD alum as well, 16D, uh, managing partner of the Blockchain Founders Fund uh, and board member of BeatDAP. Uh, so you can see we, we keep it in the family here at INSEAD. Um, uh, so just to run through what we're up to today. So we have about an hour together. Uh, the idea is to give you a little bit of a general introduction, uh, what we're up to. A very quick, uh, and for those of you in the music industry, you will find this to be um, a lot shorter and more, more perhaps concise than you had hoped, but a very quick overview of the music industry, which we're going to lean on Laura's recent expertise to, to help guide us through. Um, we're then going to dig into the company itself and the founders, the story, run through some of the decisions that they had to make, some of the conditions they were facing, things like that. And then finally, we will have a Q&A opportunity at the end with the audience. Uh, and that's where you come in. Uh, please feel free to type in your Q&A, uh, your questions in the little um, box at the bottom. We will be keeping an eye on that. Before we dive in, what is your connection to the music industry? Um, you either currently or you have worked there, you are you work or work in entertain work have worked in entertainment or you have no connection whatsoever. Sandra, can we launch that first poll for everybody? Okay, great. So we've got you know about seventy percent of you have not don't have any experience or connection to this particular industry. Uh, about twenty percent have worked in the industry and then a handful in entertainment otherwise, uh, which is great. So we've got a nice nice distribution of people here. That's that's good to see. And uh, we'll, we'll give you a rough overview um, and in just a minute. Uh, and now your familiarity with blockchain. Um, and I would like to, to give you a scale uh, to think about this on one to five. One is what's blockchain. Three is you have some familiarity with the concept, maybe a little bit of an understanding of how it works, but don't know the technology. Five is, you know, call me Satoshi. Two and four are left blank with the idea being that, you know, they're somewhere in between those two, but I uh, just want to get a sense of, of where you stand in terms of your familiarity with the technology. I can tell you that I'm about a three. So if that gives you any indication of where we are and where we're headed today. Great. Okay. So it looks like the majority of you are somewhere around where I am as well. Um, about a little more than half of you kind of somewhere with some understanding of what's going on, but not necessarily understanding the depth of technology. Uh, spoiler alert, we're not gonna dig deep into the technology of blockchain today. Uh, we are, however, gonna think about how it serves as the foundation of a business model and the business for BeatDAP more generally. So that's where we're headed with this. Um, and before I, I stop my screen sharing altogether, because um, I really would like this to be a, a back and forth conversation, um, I really wanna give just a rough high level sense 
of what the music industry looks like for those of you that are unfamiliar, because it's a bit of a convoluted, bit of a messy industry. Um, and so Laura would really like to have you jump in here for just a moment and, and give us a bit of an overview if you would be so kind. A pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Noah. Uh, knowing a good number of you here are in music or entertainment, I'll be as concise as possible. And so to paint a picture of the state of the music industry, I'd just like to outline two major factors. First, on the makeup of the industry. The music industry is large, growing, uh, and highly concentrated. So to quantify that statement, recorded music revenue was $21.6 billion last year, up 7% from the year prior. The majority of that revenue goes to a handful of players, the biggest three labels and their top artists, and the biggest streaming services, which we'll also call DSPs. DSPs, or digital streaming platforms, there are a handful of big ones, you'll know them all. Um, and while they all use their own systems in general, they all have the power, even though they work in slightly different ways. If you check out the chart on the right, you can see a massive bite that streaming has taken out of the industry since Spotify came on the scene in, in 2011. So that's the purple uh, color on the graph. Um, streaming is currently pocketing around 60% of recorded music revenue through both ad supported streams and from subscribers, which total just north of 443 million today. Uh, the second factor I'd like to highlight is while the industry has been marked by incredible technological change over the past 20 years, it has been notoriously resistant to that innovation. So to take you back to 1999, uh, 99 was a banner year for the music industry, which was earning $39 billion in revenue per annum, which is roughly $60 billion in today's money, basically three times higher than it is today. Then Napster came along. Uh, when it was released, which coincidentally was 22 years ago yesterday, uh, the cost of music went from anywhere from 10 to $20 an album to basically free overnight. So needless to say, things got messy. Um, there, were hand, there were lawsuits left, right, and center with groups like Metallica infamously suing their fans for stealing their music. And, uh, the story goes on. Uh, but for years and years after, music fans continued to rip songs from the internet and effectively took a whole bunch of money from labels and artists um, in the process. So this combination of piracy and new music formats um, cut a big amount of profits out of the industry. Um, and it makes it pretty easy to understand why music is resistant to change in some ways. Uh, so to sum up, the two things I'd like you to remember is it's highly concentrated and resistant to change. So let's get on to the good stuff. Thanks, Noah. Thank you, Laura. Uh, the amount of background research that Laura has done into the music industry in the past years is staggering and breathtaking. Um, and that was nice of you to sum up very concisely for everybody here. So thank you very much for that. The one other thing I want to point to before uh, in bringing on our guests of honor today uh, is just a little bit about sort of what the industry looks like. This is, believe it or not, a simplified version of what the industry looks like. Uh, and it really is effectively the structure of the industry. And what you see in the middle are the record labels, and they still retain a tremendous amount of power, right? Laura commented on, on the, how concentrated the industry is. And, but you'll see that there's just a whole ecosystem of all different kinds of companies and players involved. And, and the purpose here is not to dig into any of this at all and specifically, but to just give you an overview of all of the different players that are involved, the different kinds of businesses and, and business models and strategies that are required to kind of make the industry function, at least as it currently stands. There's a huge amount having to do with rights and rights ownership and who has access to which royalties and who pays those royalties. We're going to talk a little bit about that in, in sort of service of talking about BeatDAP, but I just wanted to point out where BeatDAP plays here. Uh, you can see that they're really sort of the intersection of the record labels and the rights holders, the digital streaming providers, the streaming services, a little bit around the public, and, and they extend to the artists in some ways as well, uh, but wanted to give you a sense of, of where the company sits. Um, Okay, so that is your crash course in, in the music industry that will not even get you an interview with somebody in the music industry, but we wanted to, you know, at least say we tried. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing there and, you know, we're, there's a lot to unpack in the industry and we're going to get dig into it a little bit more, especially as it relates to BDAP. Um, but I wanted to introduce our case protagonists. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Andrew Beatty and Morgan Hedu from BeatDap, who are joining us from Vancouver uh, at about 7, 10 in the morning. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and 9, 10 in the morning in Toronto. Thank you, Morgan. Um, they are the founders and see, and if you'll allow me just a moment, I'm gonna brag on your behalf for a little bit and then I'll, I'll have you introduce yourselves. Um, <clears throat> Morgan and Andrew are founders and co-CEOs of BeatDap. 
which is a blockchain enabled tracking system helping uh, record labels and artists track their songs in real time as a means of collecting and auditing royalties. Uh, the analogy that they use to describe themselves is a bit like PWC for music play count. Um, with millions of play streams happening per second per region across the world on different streaming systems. It sounds a bit more like streaming on steroids, if I can steal some of Laura's, Laura's wording there. Uh, the company's vision is to become the single source of truth for play count on streaming services, and we'll get into the details of that in a little bit. Uh, while BTAP is a young company founded in 2018, they've accomplished quite a bit in the last two and a half, three years. Um, so I'm going to brag on their behalf. Uh, they participated and graduated from a number of prestigious accelerator programs, which many of you have heard of, like the Creative Destruction Lab, uh, 500 Startups, Project Music in Nashville, which is a really wonderful incubator for uh, startups in the music and in and around the music industry, um, awarded some major accolades, such as the number two seed stage company in Canada by Crunchbase. Um, and they've managed to land some very serious heavy hitters on their advisory board, such as former Prime Minister Harper from Canada, big music industry moguls like Brian Turner, who launched NWA. Um, we were thinking of maybe having like a death row record song playing when you joined today. We thought we didn't know the audience well enough to know how that might play out. Um, and Joe Galanti, who's instrumental developing careers of Dolly Parton, Kenny Chesney, many other famous Nashville celebrities. Um, that's just the highlight reel. Uh, but let's hear from the guys themselves. The In the Case series is about keeping connected with the NCI, NCI community um, and some of the most interesting entrepreneurs and business people solving problems today. Morgan, Andrew, if you would be so kind to give you a little bit of a background uh, on each on yourselves. And then, you know, I know you, the two of you have have a bit of a business school history in your background as well. If you could tell us a little bit about how you met initially. Morgan, why don't you start? Or Andrew, did you? I saw the unmute first, whoever would like to go. Take it away. Uh, I'll go. Um, yeah, so a uh, quick background on myself. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about Andrew and I meeting in grad school sort of towards the end, but um, my professional history, I was introduced to music quite early on. Um, I started in consulting, uh, in government relations consulting in Canada. Um, and my first client was the music industry. It was the trade association that represents all the major labels um, in Canada. And the first big file that we worked on, and maybe the sort of landmark file for the trade association over the last decade or so, was extending copyright from 50 to 70 years in Canada. And that's sort of a protection for artists and labels and rights holders. Uh, and it was, a, it was a big sort of piece of work. Um, and it was sort of served as my baptism by fire into the space, particularly from the sort of copyright and legislative side. Before that, Andrew and I met at grad school. Uh, we both did our MBAs at Trinity Western. I think we met on the first day in orientation and one other colleague of ours, the three of us sort of became inseparable and um, got to know each other really well. And that was really a formative experience and kicked off you know, our desire to work together for the foreseeable future, which I think is sort of often the case with business school. Even if you don't start together necessarily in your first jobs out of it, you kind of find a way back together. Um, so that's, that was my introduction to music. I went on to work in telecommunications uh, for a number of years. Uh, and then life took me to Los Angeles and you know, brought me to the music industry in a real way there. And we'll talk much more about starting BeatDap, my side from LA later in the case, but that's a, a quick personal sketch and throw to Andrew for his, his story. Yeah, my background is in entertainment. I actually started as a lit agent. So I worked on a lot of really amazing book properties and things in that industry, uh, mostly selling uh, TV and film rights um, and packaging. Um, I moved into the music side because I invested in these kids that were building Facebook games at the end of 2006 when it was still EDU based. And uh, really, that was kind of my entry into technology and also uh, arguably into sort of uh, you know, gray area or gray hat techniques when it comes to the internet, uh, things that we are now combating. So worked a lot in this space for trying to launch artists, a lot of uh, digital promotion, a lot of things related to YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, um, built an agency up around it and then swore I would never go back to music. Uh, so I, I uh, went strictly technology, worked in tech for a while, raised some money, worked on different companies. Um, but Morgan and I were always pretty close, arguably best friends. And we, um, you know, we're always, always talking about starting something together. And it just worked out that this was, this was the thing. And, and our other co-founder who's not here, uh, you know, Poria, uh, is kind of the other piece of the pie here, because without him, there would be no technology and, and no real company here. So, you know, it was the kind of combination of all the right timing and right people in place to be able to pull this together. And, and just this longstanding history of friendship, um, 
you know, that, that kind of led us here. Thank you for those backgrounds. I like that you qualified the arguably best friends, just in case, you know, in case Morgan <laughs> wasn't quite ready to make the same statement. It's good, good that you qualified that. <laughs> That's um, exactly what I was thinking. I think this is a fair <laughs> thing to find the relationship. Best friends is totally fair. In front of 150 strangers, that's the best yeah. time to do it. Uh, good. Uh, well, maybe not strangers, but still. Uh, and so you both have some experience with music, with entertainment, from very, obviously very different angles. How was it that you you sort of discovered this particular problem, right? So so I guess maybe talk first about what is the the problem that BDAP is trying to solve, and and how did you discover it? Or you can take those in either order, uh, depending on the story. But but what's the problem here, and how did you figure out a, a means of solving it? You want me to take discovery and we can talk about the problem itself? Sure. All right. So we were, you know, sort of fortunate, both of us to be in various ways connected through to the industry. And even though we kind of left for a few years, um, still stayed close with folks and obviously been following the, the growth of the industry. And as Laura pointed out earlier on, which by the way, thank you for an awesome summary of the industry um, and to the NCN team. Thank you all for putting this together. Um, but you know, we stayed close enough and we were following sort of the evolution of the space and were approached by a number of people in, in the industry on the recorded music side in particular, basically saying that, look, there's, um, there's it's, it's a challenge today to follow sort of the billions and billions of bits that are flying around the internet to know for certain that the, you know, what we're, what's being recorded to us and what we're invoicing for is, is perfectly accurate. And it, I think what's sort of interesting is that in, I guess maybe more legacy royalty-based businesses, there's usually a third party of some sort who's responsible for verifying or auditing. Um, you know, you look at oil and gas or even advertising online, um, but music because of, I think sort of the post Napster fall off and then subsequent resurgence on streaming, you know, there's some of that, that those sort of industry specific tools just haven't been built yet. So when we heard that there might be a space for a third party who could function as sort of Switzerland um, and look at sort of this auditing at scale and as a more sort of real time and proactive technology, as opposed to what I would guess call backward looking and, and sort of retroactive traditional auditing. Um, we saw an opportunity and that was what kind of got us excited. And even in saying it out loud now, it sounds a lot more sort of fully baked at the beginning than it was. There was a lot of sort of us thinking through not just the technology, but how to address the problem. And so it's, it's always kind of fun to put the sort of the backwards looking glasses on and, and think about how, you know, straight line it seemed, but it was, you know, some trial and error and a lot of conversations. We were, you know, good MBA students in the beginning and had a lot of customer conversations and industry conversations and just tried to do our best to validate that, you know, what we thought was a space for a company like ours to exist really was there um, and understand how to, uh, you know, how to sort of best attack the music industry as a, as a early stage technology company. So that's the, that's sort of the Genesis story, I think, in, uh, in a nutshell. And Andrew, yeah, how did you sort of add, come together? Well, when when Morgan and I started talking about the problem, um, our first instinct was to validate the problem. Like one of the big things that I was worried about was being hand wavy and saying like, oh, there's this theoretical problem we're gonna solve with the technology that not a lot of people understand. And uh, also, um, you know, we can deliver on that and then let's go raise money. And there's just a lot of things that I just didn't want to risk our reputations on uh, until we were a little more sure on from a strategic decision, like just a strategic side. So that required talking to a lot of customers. Um, shout out to my mother-in-law who connected me to someone at a major label. It's always weird when someone's like, oh, I know someone in music, you should meet them. And then you uh, basically uh, say, okay, because it's your mother-in-law's friend but you expect them to be, you know, not relevant. And then you find out, you know, in this case that she was um, running all of the digital uh, data repositories for a major label. And she, this was her initiative re related to metadata previously. And it was just super happy coincidence. And so you start talking to people and you realize, hey, there's this massive problem here. They're getting reports, which it, it's not like the DSPs are trying to be malicious at all. It's just, there's an underinvestment in reporting being the best at reporting does not lead to uh, more users. And if you're in a knife fight globally trying to win user base, you know why are you going to waste such valuable resources? Like you do what you can, but it's not like it is your primary focus or job. And so there's this discrepancy that that occurs, and it just and unfortunately the the, the speed of streaming and how fast streaming is taken off it's just occurred at, in in mass. And so by the time that you catch it, the way the traditional music industry audits every three years. Um, but by the time you realize there's this issue, you're then settling for pennies on the dollar. 
There's headline risk for the streaming service. The streaming service has to suffer through the audit, like an audit's not fun. So then you have to have your engineers, you have frontline engineers helping them through the audit. So there was pain points on both sides of, of this issue. And we felt that as one of our advisors says, there's more money now to make over the top of the table than under it and being transparent and with the, with the speed that the industry is growing, now there's an actual vertical business to be had here in the you know, sort of audit and streaming fraud detection space. And then Got we it. said, okay, um, let's, let's go. Great. Uh, and actually a question that I haven't asked in our year of conversing, how did you, what's, how did you come up with the name BDAP? <laughs> there's, uh, well, basically it, it, it's a distributed application like DAP, which is what you call blockchain uh, applications, and then Beat mm -hmm. for music. So Beat distributed application also okay. just rolls off the tongue so nicely, you know? Beat DAP, right. The, the, T, the TD combination is not something you see all that often. So that's why I was curious if there was something. And to be honest, I didn't realize the DAP was like a, a common, common nomenclature. So that's helpful. Well, thank you for clearing that up, that mystery up for me. Um, so you more. identified these, sorry, Morgan. I was just saying, it's becoming more common, but I, I should add, because Andrew is the one who originated this, the internal story that we, you know, when we talk about where the name came from is really because, you know, we thought we would create a system that would allow for us to have, you know, sort of the best numbers um, in the space. And Andrew would always say, like, beat that. And so when beat DAP came together as beat and DAP, it also worked really nicely as sort of, a, you know, pound the table, beat that, uh, you know, proof point. So that's the internal, probably never shared in public version of the name. Got it. It's your story and you're sticking to it. Okay, fair enough. Um, good. So you so you identified this authentication issue. Uh, and can you can you give us a little bit more? Uh, can you quantify it for us in terms of like percentages, dollar value? Obviously, it's tough, right? You're talking about millions of streams per region per second. So that's massive. But can you can you sort of put this into into a little bit harder terms for us? Yeah, when I when I talk to um Initially, when we were talking to labels and looking through some of the some of the stuff that they had and, and discussing what their discrepancies were when they when they went in, so there's a couple of different ways that they find discrepancies. But the sort of summary was somewhere between uh, best case being eight percent underreported and worst case being thirty one percent, with an average really closer to that ten percent mark. Um, and it's and it's really death by a thousand paper cuts. So some people, there's like human error from data being transitions. There's ETL scripts that are broken as you transform data from one uh, backend or database to another, or even just between different types of coding languages for analysis. Um, there's uh, breakdowns with the actual end consumer. So if a battery turns off, like plays being lost, or uh, how do you deal with offline playback? So there's, there's actually a lot of different reasons why the counts might be wrong. And unless there's someone investigating and fully focused on uh, making sure every count is accurately um, you know, put into a ledger, that becomes sort of, uh, like I said, death by a thousand paper cuts. So it was a massive percentage uh, that's off. You have a fast growing industry where now it's cannibalizing the rest of the revenue streams. And I think the sort of thought was, how do we alleviate the pain on both sides here? Because you know, it's a multi-billion dollar issue uh, where then they have to settle um, later and, and it could be five years later after they do an audit and work through all the steps. Yeah, I, I just want to dig in a little bit because you talked about headline risk for, for the streaming providers, but but it would sound to me like if they're sitting on eight to 30% un, unhanded out royalties, that there might not be a lot of motivation for them to, to get on board. So how did how do you think about that? How did you... Had, from a business perspective, but also just how do you approach that when, when you're thinking about DSP, engaging DSPs? I mean, there's some higher profile examples of sort of public suit um, that I think are, are just a bad look for the industry overall. And funny enough, one of uh, an auditor that we spoke with said that you know, sometimes because the timelines for auditing can be so far into the future, like three plus years, and settlements can take a long time to sort of be paid, and, and just the process itself is, is pretty unwieldy. If you think about you know two and a half trillion streams, I think this year or something globally, trying to parse through all of that data is a challenge for or just sort of any legacy auditing either system or or team. Um, and so what his comment was to us is that unless there was something more efficient out there, sometimes lawsuits are just the more cost effective route, um, which was a was an interesting comment and eye opening for us. And then he added, and also there's a chance for punitive damages, which is I, I think like a really 
sort of terrible outcome for everybody involved and definitely not, I think, what sort of the, where the industry wants to go and not the motivation of anyone who's participating in it. So for us, when I think about the value of, you know, engaging with the DSP and why they might want to work with a system like ours, it's to sort of bring things back to that sort of neutral middle lane um, and avoid a situation where someone's doing the cost benefit of whether I want to, you know, engage an auditor for an 18 months to two year engagement or whether I just want to make some noise in the press and see if I can't you know, garner a settlement that way and have it be a more cost-effective solution. So I, I think that's sort of a big part of the motivation, both for why, you know, we as, you know, two guys who come from uh, the space and, and sort of want to see the best for the industry, why we built it the way we have to sort of hopefully, you know, eliminate some of that headline risk. And that's been an early sort of point that we've made since, you know, probably week two of starting the business. Got it. Which this sort of that sort of lends itself nicely to the to starting to dig into the technology a little bit. And and so, how did you think about blockchain? How did you land on that as your solution? Um, and and as you kind of talk us through that, can you talk a little bit about the the speed requirements and and where that was aligned or misaligned with with where you're coming from. Yeah, there Andrew was blockchain specifically. He was the <laughs> Got friend. It. 2012. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. I'm the weird uh, crypto friend that probably sold, was maybe one of the only ones that picked uh, I am Satoshi on your list there. Uh, so I, um, I've been in the space for a long time, I, you know, I, I starting with, with Bitcoin mining operations and then crypto trading and bots and uh, dApps on top of it. And basically just a bunch of fun things with different people. Um, so I was kind of the weird crypto friend that everyone just was like, oh, blockchain, Andrew. And so the whole thing kind of came about when we were talking and there's another guy in the industry named Benji uh, Rogers, who's on our advisory board also, who really was out there out front, like promoting the use of blockchain within the industry as a whole uh, for years. And what was really interesting about that was people started coming around to the idea of blockchain being a solution, but there wasn't a lot of consensus yet about exactly where it could be applied. People were trying different things in different parts of the supply chain, but there wasn't really a specific use case where we thought it made the most sense yet. And so what was interesting is as we were looking at this, the foundation of blockchain is really about trust. When you're in an industry where people don't trust each other, blockchain provides a trustless way for everyone to participate. I don't need to know that um, I trust Morgan because the network is going to be set up in a way that we can both operate without that trust being uh, present. And so the idea of blockchain became the way for both sides of the industry who may or may not trust each other to participate and come to and arrive at a trusted source of truth for what the play count is. Because play count then is the foundation of all, all of these royalties being paid out. And so that was sort of the focus. So we knew that it probably needed to be blockchain. Uh, internally, we did not really want to build a blockchain tool. I, I, you know, It's nice to say blockchain. It's a very different thing to build it. Uh, having been around the space for a long time, I knew that this was no easy feat. I think at the time, back then, 2017, 18, the fastest blockchain was Visa, I think, with like 24,000 transactions per second. To do the world streaming, you need to be able to do over a million transactions per second, be able to track a million songs played concurrently in different per region, right? So you got to stack all the regions up. That's really difficult. And I wasn't sure if we could do it. And so that's really where Poria comes in because, you know, perfect timing. Poria and I had been building a lot of other types of things for fun. And I knew that he was by far the most brilliant blockchain engineer that I knew. And that if he couldn't build it, I didn't think anyone else could. And so we went to him and said, look, we want you to build this. Uh, we want you to be our co-founder in this. We sort of like did the recruiting song and dance, you know, as, as happens when you try to recruit a really talented engineer. And he really loved the idea. He loved, I think people love music. Uh, and it was a challenge. If you, if you, if you know any good engineers, they love challenges. So I think, uh, I think that was it. I mean, like at the end of the day, I didn't know if we could build it. Morgan didn't know if we could build it. Poria was the first one to say, this is impossible. Uh, you know, and, but it, we, we tried and we spent a, about 15 months in stealth mode, just building the underlying technology, because if we couldn't deliver on the core foundation of just tracking plays at scale, there was no business to be had here. And that's really what we focused on. We were completely quiet. I think Poria told everyone he was working on a website. His friends probably had no idea why a website took 15 months to build. Uh, 
So that, you know, that's, that was it. And, and, and really how blockchain works is it just creates that, that environment for everyone to participate, um, regardless of whether they trust each other. Got it. And so, you know, I would imagine that much like the audience we're, we're talking to today, the level of familiarity with blockchain remains relatively low, um, savvy, but relatively low and savvy in general and technology, but relatively low. And so I'm curious when you go and you're selling this to DSPs, to rights holders, and you're talking about truth and they're like, that sounds great, but what, what exactly is going on? You know, I, I'm sure you have to translate this in a way that, that, doesn't get into the technical aspects of it, but still can can kind of explain it. Can you walk us through that a little bit for, for, for everybody's benefit here? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, people understand that there's a discrepancy. Like if you work in the music industry, it's very rare that we come into a label and we say, hey, is there a discrepancy in counts? If you have issues over the counts with the streaming uh, numbers for royalties, almost every label feels that pain. They understand that this exists. They've been through the traditional audits. It is a problem that is very much recognized. If you go to the streaming service side and you say, hey, do you enjoy being audited? What happens when it goes wrong? Uh, you know, How much are you losing in productivity to service these audits? And by the way, our simple technology, because we're a verifying play counts, can identify fraud. So we can help you identify you know, eight to 10% of money you're losing on the fraud side from bots and bad actors with the same integration. So we can service both sides. Um, very few people in, in the streaming service side say, oh no, fraud's not a problem. Like everyone understands their own problems. So it be becomes easy because we're not educating them on a problem that doesn't exist. They already know this problem's there. They just maybe didn't have a, a firm solution. So then it's just about saying, hey, look, we have this technology. We have 30 patents around it. And it's a way for you both to gain uh, by you know, being transparent with the number and, and, and verifying this count as opposed to um, trying to sit through these audits and all these retroactive things. So we try to break it down into simplicity and say, look, do you have this problem? Check. We have a solution uh, and let's make it like as foolproof and easy as possible. We will implement this solution for you and show you how to gain for both sides. And then we can negotiate in good faith on what the, what the commercials look like. But um, ultimately I think you're right. And we don't try to go down a rabbit hole of explaining blockchain because at the end of the day, it's just a tool in our stack that enables this technology to occur. It is not what they're buying. They're buying the verified authentic play counts and knowing that they can trust those counts. Uh, they're not buying some crazy technology that was just sort of the precursor to get here. Um, and so we just don't really talk about it that much, except with maybe a technical team that wants to dive deep. We talk about the value that they're getting and, and why we're providing them that value. Got it. So in the same way that you would buy enterprise software, you don't necessarily need to know the code running underneath it to understand the problems that it's helping you solve. Um, I think people see blockchain and they get either starry eyed or googly eyed or some sort of eyed that that makes people really want to better understand it. Um, and also kind of to like, you know, like any newfangled shiny object, they kind of want to get involved and figure it out and stuff like that. So so thank you for for walking through that. So you have the, the problem addressed, right? You, you identified the problem, you see the issue in the industry, you've now got the technology that, that Poria and the team, and we'll come to that, that in a little bit, uh, you, you've solved the problem in terms of the speed and building the blockchain technology. I know that you spent some time thinking through your go-to-market strategy, like what are, the, what are the possible options that you have in terms of, of bringing this to, to the music industry? Can you talk us through that process I know that Morgan, you did a bit of like a strategy boot camp session, uh, and or laid out sort of a roadmap of potential strategy concerns and risks and benefits. Can you talk us through that through what your options might have looked like? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think you know part of part of sort of defining the market for Andrew and I was to spend some time with some of our early investors and partners and think through sort of all the various ways you can attack enterprise sort of software and sales and you know partnerships because our dynamic is interesting, um, especially before. You know, we arrived at sort of streaming fraud as a as a real issue that's you know faced by DSPs and, and, a, and a potential path to turn them into uh, customers as opposed to partners. We had to think through this dynamic where one side of our uh, of our company is is our is our customers. Uh, the other side is a partner who we're reliant on for an integration, but they also have to see some benefit. And so, mercifully, you know, streaming fraud is one of those things that sort of emerged as we went along. Um, but in the early days, you know, there was what Andrew talked about: reduced headline risk. Um, just sort of be more transparent and, and, and be partners and that could be enough to be the pitch to a, to a DSP to want to participate. 
you could go a step further and you could say, look, every major label has uh, in their, you know, in their agreement, uh, an audit clause. And so you could, in effect, say beat that becomes another way of, of exercising that audit clause. And perhaps we just become a sort of a suggested integration as part of a, as part of a deal. But that's a, still a little bit adversarial. Um, there was then sort of the next question is, can we build something so valuable for the DSPs? And at the time when we initially laid this out, we weren't sure what that so valuable thing was. We just knew that there's got to be something that we can do to make this, you know, from a partner relationship to a customer relationship if we're you know, doing this integration. Um, and so what could we build for DSPs, with DSPs, that would encourage them to want to do the integration and still allow us to serve the labels and, and rights holders on the other side? Um, there's always sort of, I think maybe because my background is in politics and, and you know, because a couple of our, uh, our early investors, shout out to them, were thinking very creatively, like what's plan C, D, and E, as opposed to just A and B for how you're going to launch this business. Um, they look at some of the markets in the world where there was already sort of regulatory questions up in the air about, you know, the, the, the industry, the, the streaming industry as a whole. And so the UK was undergoing some parliamentary review and there was a conversation in India roughly the same time. Um, and so is there, a, is there a regulatory approach? Can you become a tool that's used because, um, you know, because governments actually want, you know, uh, transparency and fairness in the industry and these culturally protected industries are, are sort of special and, and unique and they have sort of dynamics in the regulatory sense that maybe don't exist in other uh, sort of more traditional industries. So there was sort of a regulatory path. And then there was sort of, I guess we call it plan five, which is sort of a combination of uh, of one and, and three, which is, can we build something great? And can we also sort of demonstrate that there's a reason why uh, even in the service of audits themselves, there's a better path forward. So those were like the sort of early five paths we, we thought about going down and how to approach them. And the, you know, as you sort of walk the path, you might not see it where you're going exactly in the beginning, um, but it opens up to you over time. And so um, we ended up landing on, on, on five effectively as the strategy. And it's been you know, what was awesome is when sort of screaming fraud kind of revealed itself to us as, you know, a real issue and something that, you know, a one company sitting uniquely across a number of DSPs um, usage reports would be able to look at much more deeply than sort of any individual DSP looking at their own data themselves. And so that was like a bit of an aha light bulb moment. And as far as GTM goes, it was, it was helpful because um, it pushed us into a path where we could turn partners into customers. And that's, you know, that's where you want to be. But it was hard so to make the decision was, go ahead because in. sorry, I was just saying it was hard to make that decision because it required a lot more resources. Like when you try to do more than one thing at a time, as opposed to like just kicking a front door down and doing the sales process and waiting 12 to 18 months to see what happens and then trying something else. If you're going to do it concurrently, how are we going to do that with a small team and limited resources, whatever? And so there was kind of a, a you know, as much as there was around strategy with the goalposts, as Morgan's describing, there was also like tactically, how are we going to get there with the resources we have, which was, um, you know, shout out the business schools for uh, for all the pre preparation for that moment. <laughs> Thank you. And so, so strategy is really the, the sort of two pronged strategy is about targeting both DSPs on one side and looking, you know, building out some a product for fraud detection, right? Because that's something that they're dealing with. And also going to rights holders and talking to them about about effectively loss through through audit problems through lack of of accurate data and things like that. And so at the same time, um, and then how did you think about approaching this industry? Right. So we talked about it being heavily concentrated, pretty resistant to change. Like, how do you walk into that situation? How did you how did you sort of present beat that present yourselves as you walk into this kind of situation? Switzerland, be mm -hmm. you know. And I, I say that like it's a little tongue in cheek, but it's it's true. We we even early on we said we were sort of anti disruptive, um, and not in a in a buzzy way. Our, our hope was not to come in and I, I should go back to something we were talking about a little bit earlier on sort of the blockchain stuff, and not to go full Satoshi, but like one of the we launched the company and effectively the blockchain winter. I mean, it was not you know if, if you're talking about some people today are a little bit you know star eyed about blockchain again, but in 2017 2018, um, blockchain was you know sort of maybe peak of its powers and on the decline for a couple of years there. And so we had to be mindful that we weren't pitching this like radical transparency, disintermediation, disruption, all the sort of D words that go along with, you know, new technology and blockchain in particular at the time. Um, and we, we've always been very intentional about saying, look, it's, it's a technology in our stack. It allows for us to do something um, to make sure everybody is, is on the same footing and a participant in each transaction, but it is not, you know, disintermediating one major player from the industry from another. 
Um, and I think that was a big limitation that we'd seen from some of the early blockchain companies that launched in music was they came out of the gates really hot, almost as if to suggest they could be not the next Napster, but that sort of disruptive force in the industry. And I think, you know, there's a sort of antibody that you build up if you've experienced that once and you don't want to experience it again as an industry. And so to come out saying that that's how you're approaching the space, I think is, is short-sighted. Um, and so we were really intentional about being, you know, anti-disruptive. We want to build something for both sides that's accretive, that doesn't, you know, you know, cut out the functional responsibilities of any one actor going so far as to make sure that our solution doesn't gather anything that you could construe as marketing level data. So when we pitch a DSP, we're not saying pass us through your customer information so that we could potentially become a marketing services company one day, which I think would be a, a, an automatic no. Um, we pass through a, a, you know, a cryptographic hash, like why we use blockchain. We get a hash that represents a real user, a verified user on a service, which that service can go and look up themselves if they needed to. But we never know that it's, you know, Noah listening to, what, uh, what do I want to go with here? Evanescence was in the case notes, so I'm throwing it out there. Um, <laughs> I was wondering um, where you're going to go with that. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, so <laughs> I'll pay for that after the webinar. Um, but point being that, you know, we were really intentional about sort of trying to make sure we had a lane and it wasn't one that stepped on the toes of major participants in the industry already, because our, our, our goal wasn't to come in and say we're, you know, revolutionizing music and, and fundamentally disrupting something that, you know, if you look at the growth of streaming over the last number of years, it's on the right path. Uh, so that was, that was important. So that's, that's Switzerland in a, in a probably more than a nutshell. I was going to say too, that that thought process itself is actually contrarian because like most tech companies are told when you start pick an enemy, make an enemy of that, that bot, that body or person disintermediate, what are you, what are you revolutionizing or changing or disrupting? And so the entire process of not disrupting is actually the contrarian like approach because we came in and said, look, labels do a thousand things to make an artist successful. Uh, play count tracking and royalties is just literally one of them. That's why their hit rate is one in 10 and the independent artist is one in a million. Uh, DSPs do a thousand things to make the experience great for consuming content for users. Play count tracking and auditing is one piece of that they have to do well, but it is not actually accretive to their business. And so the contrarian thought is like not disrupting, coming in and saying, how do we enable as opposed to you know, disenfranchise people? And so that's, that was a, was a really interesting and different approach that I think um, to Morgan's point, not just about being Switzerland, but that, that, that thought itself was so crazy uh, when you, when we were pitching or telling people about it. Yeah. You gave the shout out to business schools earlier, except business schools would be like, who are you going to disrupt? What industry, what company, <laughs> what, what business model? So it's nice to, to hear that approach. In the interest of time, I, I want to get to Q&A in just a minute, but I did want, you know, I'm an OB professor and the music industry and music is where I, where I spend a lot of my time thinking, but I, I also think about organizations. Um, and I know you're a relatively small organization at this point in terms of headcount. It's basically the two of you and, and your engineering team, your developer team. But what actually I'm interested in and something that we talked about over the course of the interview of the case is how do you, how do you build community in a small organization, right? You, you, how do you think about the culture of a startup that's actually not going to, it's not us against the world in some ways, right? That's a one way that start, startups often kind of foster co their own culture is it's like, it's us again, you know, we're taking on the world, we're changing the world. And, and in a situation where you're coming into Switzerland, that might not necessarily lend itself quite as easily. So how did you think about sort of building the team out, building organizational culture? would love to, to hear you guys talk a little bit about that. Andrew, I know you have some particular uh, uh, points of view on this. Well, I mean, I was fortunate enough to fail a lot along the way. So I think that, uh, you know, prior to, prior to BDAP as well, and I think Morgan and I both have been in a lot of companies that were, um, the culture wasn't strong regardless of the amount of lunches and free bus rides you got. So I think it was really about uh, how do we connect people authentically around a, a mission. And, and to our point, like we did, we did do the typical stuff. Like we had a, a offsite where we did mission, vision, you know, values. We did all that kind of stuff. Like what are the goalposts? What do we want? What do we want this company to look like? Um, and then we thought about the easy ways that we could implement. So, you know, my, my background in startups is always like, look, startups is about survival. Like we, we need to survive longer than others. And I think that um, culture does not lead typically lead to survival in the early phases. 
it helps you from dying when you're at scale because the culture is the thing that could totally kill you later. And so the question was really about like, what are the low impact or sorry, high impact, low effort things that we could do to create that connective tissue. And I think um, we sat down and Morgan, myself and Poria said, okay, how do we, how do we make a system of this? And so we did things like cheers every Friday, which is where everyone writes an anonymous thing about, uh, you know, we have three, you try to do at least three and you write like, Morgan, uh, you're so great looking. Uh, don't even worry, you know, don't even worry about that ball cap or whatever. Like we just like, we, it's like funny and it's like, mm. you know, we, we just like, you know, or, or Morgan will kind of like, you know, say something to me. Like we just, we love each other so much that it just, it's like, and sometimes it's just authentic. Like for you, thank you so much for staying up all night and getting that product shipped at 3 a.m. Uh, you know, it is like a very authentic and real way to appreciate someone and it's anonymous. So we don't know who's writing it, um, you know, and we don't track who's writing it. And then every Friday we just, we actually just grab drinks together and read them out loud. And it takes 20 minutes and it's so like easy because we now in the digital world have a cheers, uh, you know, Slack bot that goes out and says, please go here and put your cheers in. And it's, it takes five minutes, but it creates such a unique culture. And every time we've added someone in, you see it because they're always a little weird. They're like, man, this is weird. Like these positive affirmations. And then three weeks later, they're quickly saying, this is the best company I've ever worked for. This is crazy. I like everyone's so helpful and friendly. And it's, it's, it's like the littlest things that are just, you build a process around, um, you know, Morgan came in hot with the pitch decks. I like, I thought that was the craziest idea, but he creates these random pitch decks that are 12, I think they're 12 slides and you have three minutes and then everyone Slack decides what your topic is. We've had like ice skating as a water sport as a topic, uh, like crazy, crazy, like different topics. And so uh, the Pope mobile, like it's crazy, but like, it's really fun. And everybody in the team had like someone has to pitch that week. And so they have no idea what slides they're getting. They have no idea what the, what the topic is. And then they just go. And it's these like little things that build this experience around you guys working together and building authentic relationships. And I think that, um, you know, that's a long winded way of just saying we tried to pick very intentional things one day a week that could help build that connective tissue, but that were an automated sort of easy thing to do uh, for that future, you know, culture building. And I think that's what's played out. Got it. Got it. And I know there's a lot more thought and time that has gone into thinking about culture and organizational growth. Uh, and I'll have to tell everybody watching and, and, and anticipating that they're going to just have to read the case to find out more. Um, just before we turn it over to, to Q&A and to have Laura come in, can you just tell us a, just quickly kind of where are things now? What, what is, what's the one thing keeping you up at night? Um, just a little bit of an, uh, of an update as to where, where is the company right now and what's going on? To the extent that you can share, no, of course. Um, you know, we're 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 really excited. It's uh, this this the last couple of weeks have been really sort of great for the business. Um, launching with uh, one of the sort of our first major DSP partners, um, and and you know a, a sizable enough customer base or user base on their side that it's really going to test our uh, our product at scale. And and we've been sort of preparing for this moment for for a long while, so that's exciting. I mean, we actually. Going back in time, we built our own DSP to begin with to test our product and make sure that it was enterprise grade. But it's one thing to you know test your own product in the lab; it's another thing to set it at loose out into the world. So that's been exciting. Um, I, I think for both of us, the thing that keeps us up at night is just how fast can we go. Um, it's a space where I, I think it makes sense for there to be a third party, you know, who serves a lot of the industry. And for us, our goal is to be that company. And so, how quickly we can you know, expand and grow and offer services to both sides of the market and make sure that, you know, we are the company that wins in this space. Um, and, you know, even, you know, doing a, a case like this is sort of, it's, it's, it's amazing for us and it's really, you know, validating to sort of get to tell our story. It's also a little terrifying because for a while we were just sort of trying to operate quietly and build up a critical mass of customers and, and partners and, and sort of do it so that when we emerged, it was just sort of the de facto we'd won um, <laughs> the space. But, um, that's, I think, the biggest thing is just can how fast can we go, um, you know, can we sustain that growth, you know, for the long term. Great. Andrew, anything to add or should we cut to Q&A? No, I'm good with q and I think that's perfect. Morgan, Great. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for, for your, your thoughts and your honesty and, and your insights. Uh, Laura, why don't you, you join us and, and you can, uh, can sort of keep us or update us on what's been going on, what questions people have. 
Sure, thank you. Um, Morgan, you were just talking about speed. Um, and there's a question from Thierry who's asking about overcoming the problem of a million transactions per second um, and how you can validate those. Um, so basically, in layman's terms, how were you able to get your blockchain to work so fast? Yeah, great question. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Um, I mean, parallel processing, there's actually a blog, processing is very Canadian of me to say, um, but anyway, <laughs> parallel processing, uh, there's a blog post up on our website, talks a little bit about this, but um, we'd started, as Andrew, I think mentioned earlier on, forking existing protocols and just realizing that throughput was the constraint. Um, and so ultimately we ended up building our own um, our own permissioned blockchain up sort of from the ground up with a focus on speed and then sort of the the secret sauce, I guess, is the ability for us to sort of subdivide both within regions and then also spin up additional processing resources as demand peaks or increases. Um, and so that's, I mean, without sort of giving away all sort of the farm, that's really it. it was just this ability to scale, you know, supply of our system to the demand of streaming services who are pushing, you know, and, and streamers who are pushing transactions through. Um, probably, I don't know, what else am I missing, Andrew, in terms of publicly shareable reasons why we're fast? Yeah, there's some stuff we don't have in our patents related to how our algorithms work, but uh, but basically um, it's just that we we built a, a proprietary way for them to reach consensus quickly and also without what is you know on a technical side typical problem with uh, you know proof of work are these things called orphan blocks. So um, because our uh, because our technology can basically ver verify in any order, you don't end up with these orphan blocks. And so we created a technology that that could basically eliminate that problem. And also it helps that it's private and permissioned. So only the people participating have access to that data. That was actually a, a very specific um, requirement from the labels who did not want their data public. And so uh, it was a combination of all those kinds of things together, private permission blockchain, building it uh, purpose built for, for throughput, um, as opposed to how other chains can maybe you know be built for uh, collaboration or transparency in a different way or security or whatever. Um, and so all those things combined with, a, honestly, a lot of trial and error. I mean, it's a lot easier to find libraries now. In 2017, 18, there were not a lot of uh, uh, libraries to build this stuff. So a lot of, uh, honestly, you need a Poria. That's what you need, you know, because the Poria is the secret of your weapon. The right answer is uh, Poria. <laughs> <laughs> Super helpful. Um, we had some a lot of Satoshis in the Q&A, but we did have some upvotes for demystifying blockchain. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about Profit Rocket. And basically, when you go into a meeting with a group of music executives who are resistant to change, how on earth do you start talking about blockchain? Can I want to just say that, you know, five, four or five years before we launched the business, and Andrew mentioned his name earlier, but it's worth repeating. Uh, Benji Rogers went around the industry and introduced blockchain to music for, you know, half a decade and did a lot of the sort of heavy lifting. So we get to stand a little bit on the shoulders of giants because there's a familiarity, at least within music, um, thanks in a large part to him just being the industry's lead educator. Um, and there were others who were sort of in the space, but I, but I give a lot of credit to Benji for going in and sort of laying the foundation. So it wasn't, you know, we didn't have to stand up on a whiteboard and sort of start from the, the Satoshi white paper and work our way to today when we started talking to a lot of folks in the music industry there was a base level of knowledge there that was um you know in large part because of five years of hard work so give them a shout out in a forum like this because really you know i think our company not we, we exist for a number of reasons but a, a big reason why the educational lift at least was uh, was lighter on our part was because there were guys like that who sort of came before us and so appreciate him for that uh you know, there's probably other things we could say about how to explain blockchain if people are sort of really, uh, really sort of new to it. But our experience has been, thanks in large part also to, you know, some very high profile crypto projects of late, things like Apple Labs and others, where, you know, it's becoming sort of more mainstream. And I just feel like the educational lift is actually less taxing than it was in 2018, 2019. Can you tell me a little bit about Profit Rocket when you built your own DSP? either one of you yeah well we decided really early on that if this was going to work it couldn't be half-baked so we went and built our own streaming service to figure out what is this integration actually going to take what you know morgan went and grabbed a bunch of content from partners that agreed to let us use their music and really it was how do we pound this thing with millions of plays to figure out how we break your own system and so um 
we loaded it with music from people we were allowed to. We spun up millions of devices to concurrently play against it. Uh, we tracked it in different regions, different uh, you know operating system types, et cetera. And really the goal was how do we build an integration that is bulletproof as possible for the streaming service so that when we walk in, it's not, hey, we'd like to guinea pig on your massive multi you know, $100 million company uh, with this new technology. It's like, look, we can show you this works. We've thought through exactly how this integration needs to look. Um, we've made the integration as simple as possible for you. And we can, you know, the best part now is like our intern did an integration in uh, 34 minutes. So like it does not take long for them to actually do the integration. It just takes long for them to prioritize it. And I think that, uh, and another time we did an integration in under the 40 minute free Zoom call. We were like, I wonder, if, can we get this done and in, in under the free Zoom call cutoff? And so, um, you know, that's kind of a testament to all that early heavy lifting that we did. And that's Profit Rocket. We wanted it not to be associated with BDAP. We wanted to have our own streaming service on its own uh, sort of servers. And, and really we use it for testing. And, and every time we do any kind of major architectural change, we'll send billions of, of streams through it over like a 90 minute period to make sure we can handle the, the threshold that's required. Um, so that before we ship anything, it's, it's really well vetted uh, before it goes live. We had one last question before you wrap up. Um, and I think we're going to use Sadoff's um, about the business model. Um, if you could tell us quickly um, about VDAP's business model. Yeah, uh, really high level. So on the label side, it's just a percentage of, of royalties based on the services we're tracking. Um, we landed on that as, you know, basically because it's how uh, the industry is used to paying for services. Um, so percentage of royalties for distribution and, and sort of other things, it just is the natural way to pay. Um, on the streaming service, on the streaming service side and around fraud detection, we wanted to tie it to a consumption based metric, um, largely because our costs scale on usage and so tying pricing back to usage made a lot of sense. Um, and so we think about it as a CPM. In our case, we mean cost per million, not cost per thousand, which is confusing with advertising. And I have to give that disclaimer, but a CPM um, for uh, every million streams we analyze for fraud on that platform. So again, that, that one lines up just more with where our costs sit. And it's it's a way that in other sort of analogous industries, we've seen uh, companies with similar products charge. Great. Uh, so we are just about at time here. Um, thank you, Morgan and Andrew. Uh, Andrew, I know you were up quite early this morning. Um, and so really appreciate your joining us, your insight, um, your, sh your sharing of your story. Uh, the case is finishing up. It should be published relatively soon. Laura and I will get on that. Um, uh, and really just thank you to Pascal and to Sandra at Digital INSEAD for helping organize this. And thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, you know, feel free to follow up with any of us with questions and uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to get back to you. So thanks everyone. Take care. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys. Thank you.